Welcome and thank you for joining us. You are listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking with someone who spent more than 25 years in one of the world's biggest media companies, decided to kind of walk away from that after a lot of probably stress just to find a new vocation in her life. So she decided to start out by becoming the publisher of what was known as Sacred Fire Magazine, Sacred Fire, honoring, honoring ancient wisdom traditions. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program today is our guest, Ms. Sharon Brown. Sharon, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. Thank you so much for having me. You Good bet. morning to you. Now, we know that Earth Day is around the corner, and boy, this day and age, we can certainly honor this day probably more than any other day during the year by all the recent catastrophes that we seem to be seeing, especially those human-made ones. Tell us what Earth Day means to you. You know, I I have to agree that it, there's never been a better time to actually remember the Earth. And it's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we're, we're sitting here talking, and you're probably... Uh, in a room, I certainly am, and uh, we're using technology, and most of the listeners are, are probably you know, in their space, whether it's in a car, you know, with a podcast, or at their computer. And the thing is, like, we're, we're holding ourselves apart from the earth when we, when we stay indoors all the time. And, you know, there's, there's never been a better time to get outside. And so Earth Day, for me, is a time for um, opening all of my senses, getting outside, and really, really listening, uh, really, really seeing and smelling and opening myself to the earth. Because, you know, it's, it hasn't been that long that people have um, held ourselves apart from the earth. You know, civilization as we know it, um, cities and um, congestion it's a it's a fairly recent phenomenon if you if you look back at the long long history of the world and the long long deep history uh just of humanity um it's really fairly recent that we keep ourselves apart from the earth so for me earth day is a great time for all of us to try to reconnect uh with nature and our place in nature. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just recently having a conversation with someone. We were talking about, uh, you know, driving, you know, taking long trips. And I remember growing up as a child and uh, when my mother would take us uh, three out camping, for instance, in Southern California, we would go to places like the Redwoods, Sequoias, things like that. And back in the day, we just had your basic AM, I guess, FM radio in the car. And... You know, these were trips that would be three, four hours long, five hours maybe at times. They'd just be nice long trips. And so we would try to find things to kind of occupy ourselves on the way there. And this day and age when you talk about technology, you know, these kids basically have DVD players. They can play video games in the car on the way there. And I'm thinking, you know, what's really the point of going camping if you're going to bring all this junk <laughs> with you? Because, you know, I find myself sometimes when I take these long trips driving, that I don't even have the radio on at all. I just like being lost, you know, kind of in what I'm doing, so to speak. And you see people pulling into state parks, you know, with their RVs and, and all of this stuff, and it's like, you're, you're really calling this camping. You know, this makes no sense to me. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I, I see the same thing in my kids. And, um, you know, I can I can remember being on a camping trip, and 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 for sure there were times when, uh, you know, the whole uh, family thing, and when you're young, you don't necessarily always want to do what mom and dad want to do, and sure. you, you try to find your way to, like, separate yourself. And the thing is, that's what the that's what the media does. It it it, it separates us. And isn't it ironic, of course, that we're sitting here using media to talk about something mm-hmm. like this? And yet, it can it it can be. Um, it can be a uh, well, just a substitute. You know, it, it, it's interesting. You look at um, the the latest technology, and what's the latest technology? Well, it's virtual. Here, here's a virtual book. You know, you don't need to flip the pages and smell that kind of library smell and feel tactile the paper and think about where the paper came from. No, it's a virtual book. You know, if you look at uh, the the latest games from Nintendo, it's 3D. It's virtual reality. And of course, what's the 
what are we really doing when we're creating virtual reality? Is it just because we can? And I think really to a great degree what it has to do with is people's desire to feel in control. Mm-hmm. You know, I can control whatever book I want. My power is in my Kindle. I can have whatever book I want, you know, um, a virtual reality. I can create whatever reality I want. And I think to some degree this, um, this focus on individualism, this focus on being able to control has a lot to do with how out of control Things seem to feel right now, and mm-hmm. and in some ways, um, it's a it's a chicken and egg thing. It's a spiral thing. The less in control we feel, the more we separate ourselves from reality um, using technology or whatever whatever type of drug. Because of course, media can be a drug. You know, addictions can be more than just alcohol. You know, you can get addicted to a lot. You can get addicted to your email. You know, mm-hmm. um, in fact, I'm a recovering email addict myself. But, um, you know, it, it's really um, it's a, it's a way that we try to control what's around us. And when we think about Earth Day, when we think about um, the power of the world, really, truly, you go out and lay in a field and you realize that you're just not in control. Right. But, you know, nature has such a power. And I, and I find it so interesting that the whole uh, Japanese earthquake and uh, what's happening over there with the nuclear reactors, it, it, it's almost exactly a year tied to what happened in the Gulf. Hmm. And, you know, and I have to wonder a little bit. And, of course, I'm, I, you know, I publish a magazine called Sacred Fire. I'm an executive director of Sacred Fire <coughs> Foundation. So, of course, I, I sort of wear on my sleeve a little bit um, the fact that I'm a spiritually oriented person. And I can't help but notice um, how the timing of those um, real crises, the timing of the fires in Texas, you know, mm-hmm. there it, it's like the the world, the earth as a being is trying to, to shake us up literally and get us to notice that we're not in control and actually that's okay. Now, I don't mean to say that, that people suffering from um, a nuclear disaster is okay. Um, you know, I don't. I don't mean to try to smooth over um, what feels in our hearts like tragedy. Um, but I am encouraging people to take a step back and realize that while we may feel in our consciousness and in our hearts. Um, that that we are like the center of everything, if we take a step back and contemplate for a moment, say on one of those you know pictures of the earth that the that the astronauts took you know almost fifty years ago, mm-hmm. which is so amazing, you know how beyond fifty for sure um, but um, you know look at one of those photos and realize just how tiny we are and how vast the world is and try to contemplate a little bit what that might mean in your life. You know, I remember sharing a a picture of the Earth. Actually, it was on a poster. I was at the coast. This was probably about 20 years ago. And I took a look at that, and, and I was just kind of, I don't know, lost for a while. It was just really amazing because as the astronauts must have experienced they finally got to see this is a living entity. This mm-hmm. is something that thinks probably dynamically. You know, it has the ability to grow, the ability to change, the ability to give life, the ability to more or less take life. It, it thrives at once. And just think, it just takes a degree, one way or the other, for it to change everything. And it's uh, basically its uh, orbit of what is happening on its surface. It just takes just a degree to change a lot of things, including probably eliminating us as people. And, you know, when you talk about the recent disasters, for instance, you know, you're looking at this nuclear reactor, you know, uh, just failing here in Japan because of an earthquake, and you realize we shouldn't have been messing around with that kind of energy in the first place just because of things like this. Or 
just a couple of days ago. I'm you know, checking out Yahoo News as I'm doing an interview, and right there on BP, you know, hey, by the way, guys, we're posting $5.6 billion in profit after this nasty disaster we created. I'm thinking, why are these people still in business? It's the same thing with Chevron. You know, they finally got nailed $9 billion, you know, and Ecuador actually won the lawsuit against Chevron for what they did down in Ecuador, you know. But the fact is, as these companies continue to do this with almost reckless arrogance to the point that, what is anybody going to do about it? You know, and, and just the blatant disrespect that you see here, not just for what these companies do, you know, to the land, but also to the people who actually live there and respect the earth by honoring it each day in and day out. You think to yourself, what do we do about that? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and, and there are things that we can do on a personal level, and then there are things that we can do on a larger level, you know, a political level. On a personal level, and, and, and I am a believer that, that uh, things begin with the person. Sure. Um, you know, I, I am a, a believer that if we can make connections uh, with the earth and with the spirits of the earth, we actually start to discover the cycles and the rhythm of what the world is all about. Um, you know, and, and uh, it, it's interesting because when we talk about cycles, and, and I, I sort of heard you do it in the comments that you were just making so far as, um, I can't remember your words exactly, but I'm about to do it again, so I'll give another example. And that is that we always soften our references to death. You know, we always, we don't want to talk about death as a good thing. You know, we don't want to talk about, um, because it's tragic and it's sad and we all feel emotionally uh, devastated when, um uh, people we know or even people we don't know, people across the world are suffering, and that is very, very painful for us on an emotional level. And yet, if we step back and we look, actually look at, at things like death, we realize that without death there is no birth, that without winter there is no spring. You know, if there weren't killing frosts and certain fruit trees, wouldn't be able to produce fruit. If there weren't wildfires, certain uh, pine trees wouldn't be able to, to propagate. So as we work on ourselves individually and as we feel into the cycles of nature and as we practice, and there are things people can do. There's you know meditation and ceremony and reading. There are all kinds of things people can do on an individual basis. When we start to really feel the rhythm of the earth, and we start to really feel our place in the earth, we, we let go a little bit of our white-knuckle grasping to the world as we know it. And we suddenly relax a little bit, realizing that, hey, you know what? I am going to die. Mm -hmm. and, and when I die, it's going to open up a new possibility in another way, because the whole world as a living being, you know, if, 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 the, if the surface of the earth is, um, you know, is the skin that breathes and we are part of that skin, we don't really die. I mean, that, and that's kind of where I'm at in my, you know, I was digging potatoes the other day. You know, I was putting my potatoes in, and I had stored these potatoes. I'd, I'd grown them last year, you know, and I had a bunch of little singles, the little tiny potatoes that you plant. And I went in my drawer and I pulled up my paper bag. And these potatoes, my goodness, they had put out, you know, six and eight-inch um, runners already. You know, the vines were already growing. And as I put them in the ground, I realized, you know what? These are the same potatoes that I worked with last year. Huh. You know, they're the exact same. I know these potatoes. They've been with me for, you know, a couple of years, the exact same potatoes. And all of a sudden I step back and I say, well, my goodness, my children and their children, they really are me. And even though I can be attached to my personal consciousness and my own personal story, on the larger basis, I won't be dying because it's part of the way the world works. 
And so, you know, the things that we can do on an individual basis will bring us a greater awareness of the sort of yin-yang in the world. You know, I would imagine uh, most of the people listening to your show, um, you know, they've seen the yin-yang for sure. You know, that's been mm-hmm. popular symbol since the 60s and 70s. And, you know, and, and I did some reading once that talked about uh, the balance in the Tao, because, of course, that's what that represents, the yin and the, and the yang. And the, and the comment was that if you look at that symbol – and if you see the very fattest part, the roundest, fattest part, and if you, if you consider that to be the most extreme example of one way that things can be, the most extreme uh, illustration, if you look right underneath that big, fat extremity, there is a tiny point, and it's the tiny point, the leading edge of the other side of the coming around. And so it's only at moments of the most extreme do we open the door and have the opportunity for the other side. And so for me, there's actually a a great amount of, um, I'm even going to say joy, um, when I realize just how extreme things are getting. Uh You know, certainly you wonder how, how much we can take. But, but the recognition is the way the world works, the cycles of the world, we are on the leading edge of something that could be absolutely fantastic, but we just have to personally get in that rhythm and keep breathing. And that way, you know, and, and, and I can talk a little more about politically things, what we can do, but, but you might have another question. I don't know. No, you sound like you're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, one of the things when you talk about Chevron and 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 talk about uh, BP, and I saw that article on BP too, and I was absolutely. No, no, and then yeah. and then and then it also says, and they're eyeing the Gulf. Oh, hey, we're oh going to go God. back in there and flagrantly do what we did before. What and are you going to do, do it about again. it? Mm-hmm. I know it. Well, you know, for me, um, I, I do tend to be a uh, sort of an activist of spirit. You know, you mm-hmm. you, you do pick your battles and. And uh, the, the place that I, I seem to spend most of my um, energy is in, in trying to, to work with people and uh, be there for people. And, um, you know, and I do work with ceremony and elders and things like that to try to be, bring people a different worldview. But if I were going to take a political action on, uh, the one that really speaks to me is the movement to revisit the whole idea of corporations. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was some um, uh, leak, and I don't know a lot of detail about it, but I do know it was in the, about the 1860s, and uh, some of the reading I've done even suggests that it was almost an administrative oversight or error, the intention of granting personhood to a company. Right. And, and having done that, granting personhood, which uh, gives someone the legal rights of being a person, and, and established with corporate law, established profit as a requirement. I mean, you are failing legally. You can be sued legally if your whole purpose is not to generate profit for your shareholders. Mm-hmm. For me, the whole idea of, of, uh, of business as a person, well, it just, it just sort of goes to that separation we have from nature. Businesses aren't people. Right. <laughs> They're not living things, and when we treat them like living things, uh, well, so many uh, people, myself included, for a long, long time, uh, we just become the servants mm-hmm. in those households, the households of corporations. So um, it, it is a tremendously complex issue, and I know there are some people out there trying to, to, to fight that battle, and I, I tell you what, it's, it's tilting at windmills, but that's one battle that I, I really encourage people to fight. I may not have the energy for it, but I think it's a good one. Well, there's certainly no doubt about that. Like you said, you know, I remember reading uh, Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher back in the, in the 80s. And, and, you know, the whole idea is, you know, a good law of economics is when it serves the greater good of all. And, you know, just as before Ronald Reagan was being elected into office, uh, they were sort of changing from Keynesian economics. I can't even remember the name of the guy now, that they all embraced spend everything you can, leverage to the hilt, that sort of a thing, and basically tore down all the things that were in place that actually protected, let's call them the end users, us, to where 
all the regulations that banks were shackled with, which rightly so, because that's what caused the Great Depression in the first place, were actually now being removed. You know, right. and look at the mess we're in now. We went right back. It didn't take you know, but 20 years or less for us to be right back in the same boat that we were back in the 1930s. And you have to say to yourself, okay, well, it's really a lot of nonsense in the first place. When you step out, I remember, you know, kind of on another thought, when this Y2K uh, nonsense is what I thought of it after the fact, uh, was on the horizon and I was listening to this and going, what, computers are going to crash? What's going on here? This was actually the beginning of 1999 uh, when I heard about this. And I felt a little bit of alarm. And I thought, okay, well, then I started really thinking about it. I thought, well, wait a minute. If a computer crashes, how does that stop the sun from coming up? Mm-hmm. The streams from flowing, the birds from laying eggs and having babies. And I started thinking of natural laws. And I thought, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. People yeah. are actually getting in a hump over something as stupid as this. Now, albeit, you know, when you think of the grid itself, uh, yeah, there probably is going to be a few problems there. But here's what was really interesting. It was around that time that I started embarking on my radio career, if you will. And by the end of that year, I actually got to meet an interview. The gentleman that actually discovered the Y2K problem was working with the United States government to basically say, here's how we can solve this problem. And he wrote a book which was called Nothing to Fear. And basically he was saying, it isn't so much that this is really a big deal, it's how we're going to react to it. And it starts off in the very first chapter about basically a compound with all this kerosene and all these backup things, you know, the fence, the whole bit. You know, this is a family. You know, we're going to make sure that we're protected is pretty much the whole attitude, that we have everything we need when all hell breaks loose, so to speak. But then the place gets blown sky high because of all that stored fuel, you know, (laughs) or whatever it was. But he basically says, he says, you know, Y2K, it's not really a big deal. The problem is, is how people react to things mm-hmm. like this. And I thought, have we been caught up in such a bind with technology that we actually find it to be a need? Uh, yeah. Isn't and that an interesting way to look at it? Absolutely. And, and you know, um, uh, Y2K, well, of course, that's, you know, 10, 11 years ago, and, and a lot has happened so far as our increased dependence. On, mm-hmm. on technology in that time. And, you know, it, it, 2012 is, is certainly, uh, you know, it's a year that a lot of people have heard about so far as uh, a prophecy, Mayan prophecy. And, of course, every culture um, has its stories of um, rise and fall, collapse and rebirth, um, you know, every culture. And, you know, 2012, um, my sense is when people wake up December 22nd, 2012, because I think it's supposed to happen on the 21st, you know, that in some ways, you know, a lot of people are are perhaps going to wake up and go, well, wow, this was just a Y2K thing. I'm still here. You know, the world Mm -hmm. didn't blow up. And yet, as as a demarcation of a shift in how we live, you know, I've heard a lot of elders talk about 2012 as being the point at which pretty much everybody is going to open their eyes and go, what in the world have we been doing? And it, and it won't take many more events like, you know, a tsunami in Japan and an oil spill and a volcano in Iceland, you know, to shut down European airspace for I think it was about 10 days. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting when the, when the uh, Gulf, um, the, the Deepwater Horizon um, started spewing oil, um, and they started wanting to blame somebody. You know, everybody wanted to blame somebody. Right. <laughs> and, you know, that was a big deal. Well, you know, the, the, the governor of, of Texas at that time, Rick Perry, uh, was quoted as saying, well, you know, uh, you, you can't blame BP for this. Um, you know, that, that explosion was just an act of God. And I, I heard that, and I was like, well, absolutely it was. <laughs> you know, <laughs> absolutely it was an act of God. Um, because, uh, or, and I might say goddess, you know, I tend to be um, uh, very embracing of the female. And, and, of course, the gods, they don't really have gender as we know it. You know, you might be comfortable with God, you might be comfortable with goddess. But certainly, um, I absolutely believe 
that uh, that spirit was involved and was involved over in Japan, and um, that basically um, there are messages coming, and that by 2012, uh, virtually everyone, and I say virtually because if you think about the yin yang again, uh, you do have the big teardrop of black and you've got the big teardrop of white and yet at every moment there's a little bit of black in the white, that little circle, and you've got that little bit of white in the black. Uh, so nothing is ever uh, just one thing. Uh, so some people will wake up on 2012 and it's just going to be another day to go to work, I would imagine. But for the great majority of people, the tide-turning majority of people, there will be no question. And, and, and why I get excited about um, uh, indigenous tradition, traditional societies, um, you know, Sacred Fire, the magazine that I publish, um, features a lot of stories of elders and elder wisdom. And, and I get excited about that because when you read about the way that traditional societies existed, um, not just for thousands of years, not just for tens of thousands of years, uh, you know, some of these people have stories that stretch back literally to the beginning of time, you know, to the beginning of time as any type of human person uh, lived in it. And if you look at the ways that, um, that what they held in common, you know, what all of these societies held in common was their relationship with the livingness of the world. And, uh, you know, I was at a, a conference once, uh, an elder, uh, Tom Goldtooth, who uh, is the founder of Indigenous Environmental Network. Uh, and Tom is a big advocate for water and the mm -hmm. sacredness of water, the livingness of water. And someone in the audience said, well, Tom, you know, I work with water. I, I worked for like the Oakland whatever, waste treatment, whatever. I work with water, you know. He's the like, technological work... approach to water, in other yeah, words. Yeah, you know, I work with water, and, and, and I don't see it. I, I don't, water, I don't get it. Well, well, sacredness of water. And Tom uh, looked at this fellow, and he said, well, here's what I suggest you do. I suggest that you go three or four days without any water. Then give yourself that first drink, and you see how, what your relationship with water becomes. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, when you you know, how do you define sacred? You define sacred as everything that brings life. Mm -hmm. Everything that creates and is part of life is sacred. And when you've not had it for a while, and you get in touch with it, and you take that first drink of water after doing um, you know a fast from it, or that first bite of food, you look at it before you drink it. And you're like, wow, I, I need this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know? And so um, it, to a great degree, the, the, the traditional si societies, what they have to teach us is a way of being in the world that acknowledges the necessity of nature, the necessity of the cycles of nature. And, and so those societies actually um, create their decision-making based on uh, their relationship, their felt relationship with nature. The, the Okanagan people um, up in British Columbia, um, uh, Jennifer Armstrong uh, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful writer. And, um, and so, you know, she talks about how we can uh, create speakers in, in, uh, with her people. Basically, you would have a speaker for the unborn children in any decision. You know, the community would come together. You would have a speaker for the water. You would have a speaker for uh, the trees and for the old people who couldn't attend. And every aspect of nature would have a speaker. And they would, well, they would sit and talk about, um, you know, whatever decision they were going to make. And um, the advocates for the water would speak up. And the advocates for the unborn children would speak up, and so uh, you know people uh, people have heard about the you know seven generations, you know, and again, your listenership you know seems like it's people who have been pretty pretty conscious and pretty aware for uh, a number of years or coming to it now, and all have heard about the seven generations, and oh, the Indians, you know, everything they did was based on the seven generations. Well, when you get to be as old as we are, all of a sudden that starts to make a lot of sense. 
And when we start to um, imagine ourselves, and, and, and I'm sure not all your listenership has kids, but probably a good most of them, statistically most of them probably do. And, uh, and we have kids, and, and we have grandkids, and some of us have great-grandkids. Well, right there, we're starting to get into four generations. And we knew our grandparents, and many of us knew our great-grandparents. And so we, right now, uh, living and breathing right here, we are the center of the seven generations. We can, we can remember four generations back, many of us, or we've heard stories about the great-grandparents. We can look forward and we can see our children and our great-grandchildren, and we realize, okay, what's the relationship between my great-grandmother and my great-grandchild? And, and you start to see, gosh, you know, that wasn't that long ago. You know, you get to be 50 years old, and all of a sudden, 100 years is nothing. Mm-hmm. And if 100 years feels like nothing, at least it does to me. You know, I, I gee, boy, I, I got here so fast. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm 52, and it took me about two months to get here. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden, a history that's 100 years ago, and if 100 years ago feels like nothing, well, what about, you know, uh, 500 years? All of a sudden, I can feel this connection with decisions that are made hundreds of years ago and see how it plays out. And so it's this long continuum, this, this cycle of life. And little by little, drop by drop, you know, if you, you put, a, put a, a bowl outside when it's just barely raining and you come back in the morning and it's collected something, drop by drop, the way that we choose to live accumulates, you know, the... Um, if if we realize that, hey, there are societies in the world where there are speakers for the land, and they're working on this right now in New York State, Orrin Lyons and uh, Iroquois Six Nations people, um, my understanding is that um, they have made some uh, motions within um, a state government in New York, and the idea of giving the land legal representation and this isn't so much of a stretch. If you think about a business, a business now, sure. we grant personhood to a business. We give a business legal representation. Mm-hmm. Well, what about granting personhood to the land? And that's a very um, indigenous, uh, native, traditional thing to, to do. But but when you really think about it, well, doesn't it make about as much sense? Absolutely it does. And, of course, the land really is alive. I've never seen a business, you know, uh, meet the conditions of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, consuming and excreting and propagating, but they do on paper, you know, of course they do. A lot of excreting, actually, lately, I think. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, you know, if they grant personhood to the land in New York State, um, I think that's the beginning of a really good trend. And, and of course, that's based on, on traditional wisdom and traditional values. Mm-hmm. It's really fascinating, too, to be able to know or be initiated into an indigenous way of thought, of spirituality, and of living. You know, that you're not separate from things that seem inanimate, especially in the nature. And it's, I've always told people, you'll always know when you're becoming more spiritual. And this was just from my experience because children and babies will be responding to you. They'll be more magnetized toward you, uh, and animals will be the same way. And as I like to go and walk in parks, especially, you know, forestry, t- forested-type parks, you know, those are points where you just actually take in all the senses of, of your being to really connect with the experience of the energy of where you're at and it's really quite amazing what begins to happen. Now, I remember being um, out in one of these parks, and we decided to bring along my wife's children. And they went stammering through the park like, I'd rather be just sitting at home and watching TV. We're just walking through a park, you know, arms full of just nasty looks. And I mean, just really closing off. And I'm thinking, you know, this is really sad. Because I remember even as a child, I enjoyed these things, and I'm from the city of Los Angeles. But when we went out, I was like, this was incredible. Maybe I was just a weird kid. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But the fact is is that, you know, when you get it, like what you're talking about now, it's really truly amazing how you can begin to not only see opportunity, but it starts to calm you down that with all this garbage chaos that we're being fed about how 
nasty things in the world might be, and, and they probably are, that when you take a look at where you're standing right now, it's really not so bad. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. And, you know, it just occurred to me as you were talking, when you're talking about growing up in Los Angeles and then you would get into the parks and you would really connect there, uh, well, it reminded me of the story I just told about water. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, maybe people in, maybe people in urban areas, because they're uh, – they don't have regular access to nature. Maybe it is, uh, as young people, uh, it really they do feel the energy in a way that, that perhaps rural kids or, or less urban kids don't. I don't know. But, um, you know, it is, it, you're absolutely right about being able to, uh, to step out in nature and let your guard down and, and let nature come in. And, you know, of course, there's the whole... Um, contingent, you know, the whole tree hugger thing, you know, mm-hmm. is like the stereotype of, um, you know, liberal, liberal bleeding hearts or whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, let's attack it. You know, that's the funny thing is, as you were saying, liberal bleeding hearts, okay, that means the conservatives, the people that are conservative, they see the world as it is. Well, how do you see that world? Oh, I love what you're saying there. <laughs> Absolutely. They see the world as it is, and it's kind of like, well, Maybe you do, and maybe you don't. <laughs> yeah, what world is it that you're seeing? And the fact that we actually put labels on ourselves like that in the first place means that we're not as static as we thought we were, you know, sort mm-hmm. of a thing. It's well, and, you know, even politically, you know, um, the, the the yin and the yang, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you look at uh, electrical current and uh, it's alternating current, you know, up, down, up, down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so this, this idea of cycles of... Um, of duality. I mean, it's it's a big paradox, you know. And I have a teacher who tells me that uh, the closer you are to paradox, uh, the closer you are to the gods. You know that basically um, the it is the world is just it's wired for paradox. It truly, truly is. And and so you know, as you were saying, when things are really terrible, um, or or your mind wants to tell you how terrible it is, and you have a lot of worries or whatever. Stepping outside and taking a deep breath, um, you know, having a having a glass of water and being grateful for it can do a whole lot toward you know toward grounding you because it it really um, and of course there are, there are lots of spiritual traditions and um, I I tend to ascribe to uh, myself uh, one common es- you know essence of of what's behind all of life, but there are a myriad diverse ways that it's been expressed. Uh, just like in a forest, you know, one forest, but gracious, there could be, you know, 50 or 100. I'm not a botanist, but I don't know how many different types of trees. And certainly if you include all the plants and fungi and everything, well, there's just a, tens and tens of thousands of different ways that life expresses itself in a forest. And so... Um, the uh, natural law, you know, would would let us know that spiritual expression is a very similar thing, you know, traditional experience and and spiritual expression. Uh, So there are lots and lots of different ways um, that our connections uh, to earth can be expressed. Um, You know, the the main thing that that I suggest to people is that they, uh, they, they find, that they try to find a path and, and sort of stick with it so that they can um, deepen their relationship uh, with really with life and really with the world. And, and a lot of it does have to do, you know, with death and, and how we feel about death and how we um, accept it. And, um, you know, now, nowadays, um, uh, legally even, culturally and legally, uh, we are required to fight death. You know, if if someone is um, as though it's a battle you could win. You right. know, it's it's like right. it's uh, you know a ninety year old uh, you know has uh, some form of basically terminal cancer, and they're like, we're going to fight this thing. Well, here's and, one for you too, Sharon. This one always cracks me up. A horror film would not be a horror film if a human wasn't at risk of dying. Now, if you could take away that, what's so horrible about what you're watching? <laughs> mm. Mm. And they're yeah. usually teenagers we're killing off. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that you know that's a paradox to me too. <laughs> that's a that is that's just a that's a huge paradox to me. Mm. I, I I've I've never been a, a, a able to watch movies like that. <laughs> it just really it really gets to me. But um, yeah, you know it, it's and and you know I I personally um, while I while I'm not a huge fan of uh, of what's going on with me physically as I get older. Um, you know, I am a huge fan of the perspective and a huge fan of the really feeling connected um, to the cycles of life. And so with 2012, um, you know, if people, and who knows, I could be wrong, 2012 could, could be absolutely, half the earth could blow off. You know, sure. I, have no, I have no idea what's going to happen. But if we if we look at it with this tremendous sense of dread and fear, um, or want to ignore it, it kind of reflects, you know, our attitudes uh, uh, about death in general. And that's that's not particularly uh, realistic. As though we could um, make that not happen somehow, you know. Uh, I'm mean, I'm surprised actually that the government doesn't have, a, a, you know, the the president's commission on uh, 2012 stopping 2012. You know, we uh-huh. heard this is going to be a bad thing. We put our best thinkers on it. You know, we're going to stop this thing from happening. Uh, somewhere, I'm sure there's a committee. They just haven't been getting much press. I'm sure. Now, you are the publisher of Sacred Fire magazine, which is, uh, you know, reawakening the indigenous heart in all of us. You know, getting us to respect the earth. It's probably has articles, and I would guess, you know, just to guess, I haven't read the magazine myself yet. That really bring out that this really happens around the world, that, you know, this isn't just an isolated group somewhere. You know, it goes back to when you were talking about to change things in the world, each individual has to change their habits, you know, in the direction that they want to go. But sometimes people can feel overwhelmed when they think, well, I've started to make this conscious choice to move in this direction, but yet, you know, I still see in the news and I still see, you know, here on radio and television uh, that it really doesn't seem to make a difference, so I'll just go back to the way things were before. So I guess my question to you is, because you're the publisher of Sacred Fire magazine who spent more than 25 years in the one of the biggest media companies, what was it when you were spending that 25 years of your life for this company that shifted in you that made you move to the direction that you're in now and to hold on to it with passion. Mhm. Yeah. You know, it's um it's interesting. The the business world um is seductive. That is that is one of its uh, technology is seductive. Mm-hmm. Um and it does have to do um I think with this idea of um uh it's exciting, you know, p- personal power. Uh, the feeling that um, that you are uh, becoming something, you know, there's a lot of societal uh, pressure there. I, I, you know, I think so far as what shifted in me, um, I think it had to do to some degree with getting older and with becoming more and more aware that who I was inside from the time that I was a child uh, really needed um, expression. Mm-hmm. You know, when 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 I was um, a little person, I can remember. Um, in fact, my parents were concerned about me. I was a little bit nearsighted, and and I loved to stare down uh, the drain holes at the swimming pool mm-hmm. uh, because you know, it was like four or five, you know, and and I loved it because there were all these tiny little rocks, and it was like a little tiny world, and I I could feel this connection um, just with with the water on the rocks. There was just something beautiful about it. And I, you know, I was five or six years old and I used to love to sketch, um, you know, little islands, little little places where you would grow your food and you would have your animals. And of course I was growing up in um, uh, the 60s enough to, uh, you know, when I was uh, seven, my mom wouldn't let me have a granny dress, you know. I remember the granny dresses from the hippies were so popular and I couldn't have a granny dress. But there was, there was always something um, inside of me that um, carried that childlike awareness. Um, when you're a little kid, uh, it's not unusual to talk to your favorite tree. You know, it doesn't feel strange mm-hmm. uh, to have a pet. 
and to really feel like you can communicate with that pet or you would see the moon and I still do this you know when I see a moon I'm just like hi moon hey moon I did it in high school. I'd talk to it. You bet. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and that's and the truth is that that is real. It's mm-hmm. real, and the moon feels you, and the trees do feel you. And I I have shamanic teachers, and I have my own uh, practice, a uh, spiritual practice of experience of I've spoken with corn mm-hmm. in journey work. It's it's a real realm. And so as we get older, um, and as we get acculturated into um, a world in which business is um, got a life, you know, and government and every you look at all the media and everything around you and it tells you you do this one thing. And so I did this one thing. You know, I, I, I was sort of born a little bit wired for media. I'm a communicator and, and so found a way to make a living doing that. And yet I can remember being in board meetings with um, some of the, uh, and they're not big names, um, but, you know, John Malone in the age of cable, you know, uh, the Darth Vader of uh, the cable industry. I can remember being in a where I felt like everyone else in the room was a grown-up, but not me. I was like, you know, all these people think this is real, you know. Right. And, and I was good enough at what I did, that, that um, but that's where the stress came from, because, of course, it was very stressful to have this uh, uh, childlike connection uh, wanting to carry that that joy, you know, it's joyful to say hello to the moon, and I didn't want to lose that joy, so I carried it with me all through my career time, and yet I would go in these situations where clearly no one else had said hello to the moon the night before, and mm-hmm. and I and I, there was cr- tremendous stress, and I finally got to the point um, where uh, it was it was time to uh, let that go, and you know, life's too short. Uh, to live, I'm going to say a lie, you know, um, life's too short not to express who you feel you are inside. Mm -hmm. And, of course, some people, I'm a big believer in the cycles and the Tao, and that some people who they feel inside, well, they feel like they're a corporate warrior. You know, they're that dark spot in the middle of the white, uh, teardrop, you know, right. nothing is ever just one thing, and so I can't, I can't find fault per se in someone expressing themselves and themselves as corporate warrior, and they play the part in this divine paradoxical dance, this divine play, this divine dance that is paradoxical, and none of our minds will ever get around it, uh, and that's their role. Somebody had to be George Bush, you know. Somebody mm-hmm. had to be born and be George Bush. Uh, because that's his role, you know. But for me, in my life, that's not who I was. And so um, I finally just had to to give more time to um, letting myself express myself in uh, whatever remaining time I've got in this place. I think, too, what really can take away from a person feeling inspired to move in this direction that we're talking about today when it comes to becoming the indigenous self is that we tend to parade and show a high level of respect and celebration to these people that, you know, like in the corporate world, you were talking about the Darth Vader of cable, you know, or it could be, let's say, you know, Michael Milken or whatever the case was back in the 80s, you know, these big corporate raiders. And and you take a look at how we celebrate this and we think to ourselves, but what truly are we celebrating in these individuals? Is it their ability that they can control and wield a power that allows them to do whatever seemingly they feel like doing. And I think also back to a time we uh, had a guest, Tim Ferriss, who wrote a book called The 4-Hour Workweek. And I remember uh, reading a particular paragraph in there that simply he says, yeah, sure, you negotiated the best possible price you can get on your brand new Lexus. But what have you really done in the world that's contributed to anything to making it a better place for everyone else? Yeah. That, that is such a powerful statement when you think that we place so much uh, respect, if you will, you know, towards status. You know, this idea that, well, this guy up here with all the toys and all the money, you know, that's great that you achieve that, but what have you really done? And I get that there's a great example of, of, of For instance, Warren Buffett had a marvelous biography on him. You know, Berkshire Hathaway was a textile mill. 
that he never really bothered to update, but he kept this thing open because he realized this was something that was actually contributing economics to a particular community for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. So although he could have shut this down, he says, no, I'll keep it running, and even at times it became profitable at times, but that wasn't a concern. His concern was keeping these people working. It was, it was families. It was lives. That's the way he's seen business. And you think, what are these people thinking? I always wonder what perpetuates the thinking in these people that basically take away more than they give as, as, as they're hoarding their lives, so to speak, and how that continues to perpetuate. Where does this thinking, how does it keep itself alive like that? And how do you live with yourself at the end of the day? You know? yeah. Yeah. But there are people, as you, you know, people just like yourself, I've also seen too, not to start pointing fingers and calling these people the bad guys because they have bought into a culture. They've basically been raised in a culture that says, this is natural, this is okay. But you're starting to see some of these people are snapping and going, wait a minute. You know, this just some, there's just something that's not fulfilling about this. Yeah. Well, and the stories, um, you know, all the traditions have the stories of um, of the fall. Mm -hmm. You know, of of people uh, losing their way, and um, nature steps in, the gods step in. Uh, but basically, it's it it is a cycle, and when you can step back and look at life from a from a tremendous distance, you know, looking back thousands and thousands of years, um, well, you realize that these aren't just myths; these aren't just stories. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the stories of Noah, you know, and the flood. Um, there are stories in the Hopi tradition, stories in the Weichel tradition, where. Uh, people uh, lose their way, and 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 suffering comes. You know, a lot of people suffer, um, and yet at the same time, um, there is a, a reflowering and a and a rebirth of um, of connection. And so it's it's um, it's it's one of those things that you know you can talk about it. Uh, you know, people can have a a mental intellectual understanding. Well. You know, yes, this is this is just something that you know is going to happen, and and they can wall themselves off from the experience, or basically um, embrace it as part of the cycle of life. I mean, personally, it's it's kind of exciting to to feel that um, we are we are entering a time um, that will become in the generations and generations and generations to come will become. Uh, part of the story of um, of what's happened in the world, and and you know it's not um, it, it's not uh, necessarily something to um, feel in some ways is unique. I mean, you know, I, I, I lately lately I have this very sort of complex um, feeling about the cycles of time and and feeling that. Um, uh, because you know, time it's time is the fourth dimension. You know, I've I've been doing a little bit of more reading, and um, you know, we can perceive three dimensions. We really don't perceive the fourth dimension all that well. Um, there's a book, Flatland, that maybe people remember reading. You know, about the two-dimensional world, and kind of describes a little bit how hard it is to perceive a three-dimensional object from a two-dimensional world. So anyway, time is really hard for us to to get our hands around. And lately I've been, uh, you know, just in my practice uh, tr trying to feel into the fourth dimension a little bit. And, you know, I, 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 if I had been alive in 1917, I would have thought it was the end of the world. You know? <laughs> seriously, you know, seriously. I mean, you just had World War One that was just absolutely horrific with, with these machines that flew in the sky and dropped incendiary bombs. There's mm -hmm. never been anything like aerial warfare, right? You had mustard gas, stuff so nasty that it, that that worldwide we've outlawed, you know, biological right. weapons. So nasty. There was a flu epidemic that didn't hit the old people and the babies. It killed people in their 20s and 30s, and it killed tens of millions of them. You know, you look at the casualties from World War One. Back in those days, you counted your casualties uh, not in tens of thousands like we do today or 5,000 or 10,000. No, it was in millions. You know, right. Russia lost 14 million people to the war. I can only imagine um, in those times 
um, even without stories about 2012. I mean, at that time, 2012 was a whole hundred years away. Right. It must have felt like the world was coming to an end. And indeed, life dies and is reborn at every minute. You know, what, what 2012 is about in some ways is no different than in 1912, 1917. It's where are we in our relationship to it? And where are we in our uh, relationship to dropping our artificial guard, our cultural guard, dropping, um, oh, people are going to think I'm crazy. Oh, you know, I used to, when I was little, um, I used to have, you know, this special flower that came up every spring, and every time I saw it, you know, I felt so happy, um, you know, and, but, but I can't do that anymore. It's just a plant. I'm just going to go to Costco and buy them as cheap as I can. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, it's, it's like we need to remember that mystery, that mysterious, joyful engagement we had with the world and, and light a flame under it. In fact, lighting a flame is a great thing to do. You know, one of the things um, that, um, and you look at virtually any uh, ceremonial situation or special occasion, you know, you bring out the candles on this special occasion. Well, for myself, I like to make every day a special occasion. You know, mm-hmm. I'm lighting candles all the time. And, and sitting with fire, uh, fire is a tremendous teacher. Uh, the elementals, uh, water is a tremendous teacher. And it can sound crazy, um, you know, and it does take some time to make those connections, but in some ways it doesn't take any time at all. It, but what it takes is time. It takes, it takes carving out the time to sit, quiet yourself, open yourself, and basically release your judgment and release your preconception and release your expectations and just open yourself to the world and listen deeply. And so, um, you know, with a magazine like uh, Sacred Fire or, um, you know, we have an event coming up in uh, northern Washington up in Port Townsend uh, in May called Ancient Wisdom Rising. And we're bringing elders, because you had mentioned, you know, is this a, a, a global thing? And it is. You know, we have elders coming from New Zealand, from Africa, from British Columbia, from Guatemala, from Mexico, from India. Um, We have elders coming from around the world, and they have a common message and a common teaching, and it has to do with how can we experience the livingness of the world, what are things we can do, how can we be together, and they have ceremonies and they have teachings and things like that, just like in the magazine, to try to give people that bit of confidence because we do carry this connection. We all have an indigenous heart. No matter where our uh, genetic ancestry is from, no matter where, there was a time, whether it's in China, whether it's in Ireland, whether it's in Italy, um, there was a time when every Every single person, every single people had this unique, innate, living connection with the world, and we still can. We just have to slow down. And so some of the teachers, you know, come into Ancient Wisdom Rising or that you read in Sacred Fire, they've just got some suggestions and some tips to help people find that connection. Now, Sharon Brown, if you could, why don't you give out your website so people can find out more about this? Oh, sure, and, and thanks for asking. Um, it's really pretty, um, a pretty basic, uh, sacredfiremagazine.com, all one word, sacredfiremagazine.com, and uh, ancientwisdomrising.com, all one word, just ancientwisdomrising.com. And, um, and, and both of uh, those, the event and the magazine, are projects of Sacred Fire Foundation, and uh, that's sacredfirefoundation.org. And the, the three sites are all interconnected. And uh, thanks for inviting me to give that. Yeah, if people are, are curious, I invite them to, uh, to check us out. Very good. It's been a pleasure to have you on our program today. Wonderful. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Our guest, Sharon Brown. Ancient Wisdom Rising. We can all certainly use that in today's tumultuous world. We also encourage you to visit us at our website, which is beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50. Five zero. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter and also be sure to visit us at our blog where we archive our shows and have great multimedia venues for you to use and share with others. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. 
This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program, and remember, live your day past halfway.